A very warm good afternoon to all of you. Hello and welcome to Track Five: Looking Beyond Immediate Recovery: Pathways to Sustainable and Resilient Livelihoods. On day two of the Livelihoods India Summit. Before we get into the summit, I would like to cover a few housekeeping points. Today's sessions are being recorded, and you will be able to view them on YouTube channel under the name of Access Development Services. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it further. We also invite you to comment and question. Please take a look at the Q and A chat box on your screen. If you think of any question of for any speaker at any point, you can type it in the chat, and we'll hold it and we'll hold it there for discussion portion at the end of the session. I welcome you all to the session Aspirational Job Local Jobs for Rural Youth Emerging Trends curated by UNDP. It's my pleasure to welcome the panelists for the session. Shri Atul Kumar Tiwari, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Ms. Sabnam Sinha, Lead Educational Specialist, the World Bank Group. Ms. Muhizo, Inclusive Growth and Prosperity as Advisor and Team Leader, UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub. And Mr. Sujit Kumar, Co-Founder, Odan. The moderator for the session is Professor Sambhu Prasad, faculty at Irma. And with this, now I hand over the session to Dr. Sambhu Prasad to take the conversation forward. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Priyank, and welcome to all the panelists and the participants. Um, I think some of us are aware of the State of India's Livelihoods Report 2021 earlier this year. I mean, the latest one has also just come out. And I think what was I just like to start with taking a few points that were flagged in the introductory chapter that India, while has been growing a bit, has moved from a job full growth to a growth that was jobless to a growth that increasingly in many sectors is becoming is going along with job losses, and of course the pandemic has also come in this context. So we have dealt with the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, pandemic largely in terms of coping with the immediate health and other related issues. So there has been a lot of relief operation, but I think with the pandemic largely behind us, or at least we have learned to cope with the disruptions. I think a greater challenge is to look at the recovery of uh, livelihoods. especially for people in rural areas in some cases rural areas have absorbed much of the labor that has come from the urban areas but it raises some questions about the nature of employment and i think this was raised in the soil report last year as well that much of the employment that we are looking at is either inadequate it is insecure and in some cases very indecent as well so with a greater focus on the need to build rural capacities uh, and to look at rural aspirations this session will take up uh, some views of the panelists on ongoing efforts and also with undp's own understanding which i think has brought out most strongly in the world inequality report so how can we try and work towards the situation through skilling and other schemes uh, by contributing to improving the capacities of people in rural areas to go for more aspirational jobs and i'd like to first welcome uh, shri atul tiwari the additional secretary of the ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship so skilling rural india in some sense is all about also building the local capacities to boost rural income this includes skilling the strengthening the skilling ecosystem at the local level and ensuring the demand supply matches in the skilling ecosystem so we would like to hear from you what are the various strategies currently being used by the ministry of skill development to strengthen the uh, skilling ecosystem at the district level over to you mr tiwari uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone and good afternoon professor uh, for raising a very fundamental point uh one we know that our economy is changing from agro based to manufacturing and service based industry so on the lower end of the skills there is a more supply than the demand whereas on the higher end the workers with secondary or tertiary education or skilling is 
outpacing the increased uh, uh, in, increased supply. I mean, there is more 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 demand than the supply. That is the point I wanted to make. Then we also have this transitioning from the to rural to urban that is also poses a problem. So what we have done is that uh, the government from uh, they have taken that skilling from government as a whole kind of concept, wherein what the rural areas, whatever it is being done through say NRLM or agriculture department or food processing department, as well as our department is also being factored. Uh, as you know that uh, uh, there are so many, around 10,000 FPO schemes are there, then we have agriculture invest infrastructure fund is there, dairy development, fishery development, and other such schemes are also there. I was earlier working in rural development and, and I know about the SSG groups and NRLM and the corporations which they have made and the immense amount of strengthening of the women entrepreneurship more like a group effort has been done in these areas. So, so if you're looking for the skilling and employment for the rural areas, my contention is that we need to go beyond the skilling landscape itself and cover the other economic sectors as well. Second thing is that how do we do it, whether it shouldn't happen in sporadic events. So what we're trying to do is that under the SUNCAL, the skill development schemes. So in a sense, the planning for the skill development with the district as a unit has also been factored and when which there will be a convergence not among our the uh, skill training activities, both the state and center and we take a skilling leading to employment as a whole kind of a concept. So that is also the district uh, skilling uh, committees, they have also made district skilling development plans have been made. And we're also trying to uh, correlate it with the, uh, the survey which is done under the Antyodhya in the Rural Development Scheme, as well as uh, other secondary sources data so that we know that exactly in this district's concern, what kind of skilling would be required. A, which was required in the transition to the urban areas. B, which is required as a kind of a step up activities in the rural areas as well. So that kind of a data, we are trying to get it. And linking it with the Pradhan Mantri Kaushal Vikas Yojana, which is our funding part. So analysis is one part. How do we fund those schemes? That is, we're trying to link with PMKBY. And the emphasis is getting more and more on getting customized solutions for the scaling based on the local demands, rather than going a one-size-fits-for-all kind of a, an approach. And of course... In, the, in this, uh, we are also trying to have this uh, skill, uh, the industry 4.0 job roles are there. Then in the in the basic plan itself, in the 3.0, we have given a lot of emphasis on the making the skill development more demand-driven and decentralized in its approach. And the 3.0 target setting, target allocation, which we had done, that was also based upon the confirmation from the district scaling committee that indeed, these are the job roles they would require in near future in their areas. However imperfect that may be, which we are trying to make it more and more uh, pertinent by way of our UG Mahatma Gandhi National Fellows, MGNF has also been used. So I, I would say that on a conceptual level and on an organizational level, there's something which is happening under the District Skilling Committee, as I say by the MGNF, under the Sankal project, and also taking the guidance of the state, state skill development missions. And as you know, not many states have uh, kept the skilling as their prime uh, concern in a sense that many states do not have even have dedicated people on the state district level to handle the skilling, etc. So that is what we are trying to do in that sense. Along with that, we are also trying to, under the STRI project, to uh, strengthen the ITIs and uh, the industrial training clusters a lot of emphasis is being given to the apprenticeship nowadays. And uh, it is here that uh, uh, the, the UNDP, I was told that they have something called Bij Saki and managerial scaling models. So maybe we can link uh, as we are trying to converge the different departmental skilling schemes together or the district uh, as a unit. And similarly, we can do similar innovative proposals maybe under UNDP or any other such platform so that we can uh, go for more 
focused uh, rural skilling as much as possible, which leads to impact. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tiwari, for outlining the uh, the broad contours and for pointing out what is very interesting is the uh, convergence at the district level. Uh, and also you mentioned that uh, the, with the district as a unit, you're looking at customized solutions. Um, so in a country like India, with the kind of diversity that we have, uh, can you give us some examples of how the government is taking up these customized solutions in Sankalp and PMKVY, uh, as opposed to the earlier model where, you know, it probably was closer to a one size fits all kind of situation. So any insights and which you would like to share with participants on, on that? Yep. Uh, the well, very customized, what I mean is that, see, uh, there has to be uh, the overall framework, which is the NSQA framework. And uh, which is the nurses and job roles have to be defined. That is one. Second thing is that within that, for example, in a district skilling committee also, we did an analysis. We found out that there are certain uh, or maybe around 40, 50 percent, which are the generalized skilling requirements all over India. For example, logistics is there, retail is there, health is there, healthcare or something like this is there. Other than that, there is one portion which was left unattended so far which is the local level demands or maybe a regional level demands in that sense. So we have, we have through the analysis of DPSP and also linking the data with Antyodhya where there is a, what is the skilling centers uh, density in that area. And also, for example, we can also link it with the CMI data for that matter. We have also informed the district skilling, the state SAS, what is that? SSCs, sector skill councils also to conduct uh, this kind of, uh, uh, what's the like, localized job demands. So that is on the, on the uh, approach level. For example, I would say that, for example, recently in, in Jammu and Kashmir, we did this, something with the Hamda thing. Then somewhere we are doing the liquid medical oxygens uh, kind of special project we are doing. In Nagaland, we are doing something on the food processing. Then we are something also aligning with the, uh, the uh, flagship schemes like Peer life or the Kati Shakti or the Jal Shakti or the, uh, the project for the power ministry to change the meters. So wherever this localized requirement, for example, if something is being done in some state, which is not being done in other state, that also factors in. But what we require from this is that there has to be some amount of the industry getting their skin into the game in a sense that they also pitch in in terms of giving support, in terms of giving maybe if not employment, at least apprenticeship, and also getting it, the, our skilling uh, job roles also more specialized and uh, up-to-date as far as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, just to inform all our participants, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Tiwari will not be with us throughout the session and uh, uh, because he has some pressing commitments which we need to honor, the parliament is in session. Uh, so I would like to encourage either the participants or even the fellow panelists in case you have any question. I have one final question, uh, which is to do with what's the kind of readjustment you've had to make because of this very significant game changer in the form of pandemic, uh, which might have affected many of the plans in some sense. Uh, the, see, the effect of the pandemic was, uh, uh, in a sense, certainly pervasive. And if it has affected the edu mainline education, then certainly it has affected us as well. And uh, for many times, uh, for many months, actually, the many skilling centers were also closed. In fact, on the June, when we were launching our uh, customized uh, crash course for COVID, then I had to literally, and secretary had to uh, talk to the chief secretaries and get those centers open. So there was a problem on that account. We also had, uh, uh, I mean, at best what we did was that uh, we ensured that the safety and hygiene precautions are obtained. We also proposed a wire media so people do not need to give their finger prints or whatever for attendance. We had a lot of emphasis on online and blended courses. And, uh, uh, I would say that thanks to the uh, the dynamism of our training providers and the 
candidate themselves that now the things are getting more and more in line. Even though certain poker pockets, we have still problems. But yes, it was a very bad time for all of us. Thank you so much, Atulji, and uh, pleasure to listen to you. And we do hope that you uh, we could recover well from uh, the pandemic and many of your training programs are back on course. Uh, and of course, all of us have had to customize based on the evolving system. Uh, and hopefully, some of the targets that you had planned and your ideas would come to fruit. We hope to, of course, hear more from, I'm sure Shabnam will also speak a little bit about uh, Sankalp a bit later. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, ideas and we look forward to carrying this conversation further. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, all the fellow panelists. Namaste. Thank you. Um, we now would like to move on to, um, <clears throat> you know, a perspective from UNDP. Okimoto Queta Tip. I hope I got the name at least reasonably right. Mizuho, uh, you, UNDP India has been leading the UN's, in some sense, a socioeconomic response to COVID and building back better the theme that many organizations, both nationally and internationally, are part of. So post the pandemic, we'd like to understand from you, what are the different approaches that UNDP has used in Asia Pacific region to promote uh, local jobs, particularly post COVID? Over to you, Mizuho. Thank you so much um, for the introduction, Professor Shampu Prasad, and uh, it's a pleasure to join all of you uh, in the discussion today. So um, I just want to start by giving a, a few perspectives from the region that kind of sets our approaches. So um, we all know that COVID-19 had a massive disruption in the economy and also the markets in, in the Asia Pacific region. But you know, our concern is the particular impact among the young people, especially those um, age 15 to 24. And we all know that you know um, there are many data that uh, attest to this and we know that young people in the region were more heavily impacted by job losses. And there was 10%, more than 10% decline in employment in 2020, which was much higher than compared to the adults. And alongside that, you know, youth-led enterprises were negatively impacted due to collapse in demand and also supply chain disruptions. And uh, we also learned that young people are not uniform and there are particularly young women who were um, disproportionately impacted during this time. So we foresee a, a risk of uh, long-term exclusion of young people from the labor market. And this is not just a phenomenon of today, but uh, it was a result of pre pre-existing labor market um, vulnerabilities and inequalities and gender disparities. And we must remember that, um, you know, even before the pandemic, more than 160 million young people in the Asian Pacific region were not in employment, in education or training, and nearly three quarters of them were women. And furthermore, more than eight out of 10 young people in this region were also in informal employment with very limited safety nets. Um, and we know that the rural urban disparity has a lot of impact on labor exclusion, but also in terms of accessing education, which is a really fundamental step towards transitioning to productive employment. So um, this is just to set the context that our, our really concern is around the young people and, and, and the women really the leaving no one behind agenda is really at the top of our agenda. And this is why UN believe, UNDP believes that targeted and effective investments are needed to improve labor market prospects for young people. And uh, our approach is very closely aligned to the SDGs as well as ILO's uh, decent work and future work agendas. So um, in response to the pandemic, UNDP supports governments and partners in the Asia Pacific region to adopt a wide range of measures to stimulate economy and employment, but also to support enterprises. And specific measures include, for example, access to livelihood opportunities, strengthening SME resilience, and supporting education to work transitions among the youth. I just want to highlight a few examples from the countries uh, in our region and a few from other regions as well. First, UNDP supports um, strategically towards policy change 
So in Malaysia, for example, we partnered with the Ministry of Entrepreneur Development and Cooperatives to co-organize a webinar inviting international and local experts to discuss and facilitate exchange on business recovery measures for MSMEs. And one of the key areas that we discussed was the lack of risk insurance mechanisms among MSMEs that creates inequalities between big and small businesses to cope with the restrictions and social distancing measures. And uh, we were very pleased to see that uh, um, subsequent to this webinar, the ministry announced the plans to introduce affordable insurance and protection measures for those working in MSMEs, but also uh, in informal businesses. And this included extension of financial protection, employment benefits, and safety nets. And you can see that this will cover a large number of young people. And secondly, UNDP supports public and private sector partnerships to strengthen SME resilience. Um, in Cambodia, uh, sorry, in Colombia and Turkey, UNDP collaborates with the Global Compact, International Ch Chamber of Commerce, and maybe major pro private sector partners like Microsoft, DHL and PwC on what is called the COVID-19 Private Sector Global Facility. And through this facility, UNDP supports the private sector and also government to co-create solutions to support and promote SME resilience. These include, for example, empowering SMEs uh, with digital capacities, integrating SMEs into sustainable procurement and responsible supply chains and boosting access to capital. And thirdly, UNDP engages young people directly and also we work with them to generate evidence to support policies and programming for youth entrepreneurship. So UNDP's Youth Collab uh, is an initiative that directly supports the youth entrepreneurs in 30 countries uh, in the Asia Pacific region to assess how young entrepreneurs were affected during COVID, but also what were the innovations and opportunities that were catalyzed? So looking at the hopes and the futures. And the results of these surveys are helping inform UNDP to work with partners and connecting these youth, youth entrepreneurs to various funding opportunity as well as technical assistance support. And fourthly, UNDP addresses the adverse impact of pandemic on women, uh, including young women. So in Bangladesh, UNDP partnered with UNCDF and also with Bangladesh Bank Credit uh, Guarantee Scheme um, to adopt financing tools, uh, for example, the Women's Economic Empowerment Index to provide recovery funds to women-owned enterprises affected by pandemic. And we were pleased to see that the government of Bangladesh has scaled up the credit guarantee scheme with its own budget of over $2, uh, $2 million dollars to further expand the stimulus package that aimed to revamp the local economies. So these were some of the examples I wanted to highlight, but um, as a food for thought, um, I'd like to reflect on a few opportunities that we foresee that could boost youth employment in rural areas. Um, first, we noted that um, the increasing demands for diversified food among the rising middle class is creating off-farm employment opportunities in food-related uh, manufacturing services. So we foresee that labor-intensive agri-food industries can create jobs in the rural areas, including among large numbers of young um, youth who are maybe less educated and had opportunities for skilling. Um, and we look at this agri-food industries um, um, offering, offering opportunities, many other opportunities, including food security in the region. So um, really the agriculture value chains present an untapped, huge untapped um, opportunity for entrepreneurship, uh, business development and wage labor. But this could be done with more focus on young people. And I think here um, the governments could play a key role in providing in incentives and supporting schemes and standards um, to promote agriculture value chains and creating farm and non-farm employment. Um, and as um, uh, Mr. Tiwari was also saying that we ha um, have many opportunities to engage at different levels, macro, meso and micro level. At the micro level, government can obviously offer important um, support to establish regulatory frameworks, um, national development strategies and trade policies that can support these value chains. And at the meso level, industry standards, um, business can develop and improve channels of, um, of an efficient, efficient value chains. 
And at the micro level, and that's where I think we also come to the district level, the investments in skills development, the technology upgrading and access to capital will be very important for integration of young people in the value chain. And the second opportunities that we foresee is digital transformation, which can provide significant employment opportunities for youth in the rural areas. The universal access to digital solutions can reduce inequalities between um, the urban and rural areas, but it can also offer marketing, uh, mar making digital solutions as a lever for productivity among SMEs and informal workers in the rural areas. And and the um, universal access to digital solutions can also support developing digital skills among youth um, aligned with the market needs and supporting digital innovations in rural development and youth entrepreneurship. This final point um, is the opportunities that we see in green transition in rural areas that can help diversify the rural economy and provide green job um, opportunities for the young people. And the job creation could be done through many means, um, including production of supply chains, of um, uh, sorry, production and supply of clean energy systems, and uh, setting up new energy service company that, that serve the rural communities, as well as ecotourism in rural areas, including through supportive sourcing industries like construction, agriculture, handcraft, and other services. So um, uh, this, um, thank you for the opportunity for um, UNDP to share some regional perspectives. Maybe I'll pause here and hand over back to you, Professor Shambu. Thank you so much, Mizuho, for a very nice overview and some of the challenges that are faced. In fact, I would like to have a little bit of comment from you on, you know, a quip that has been made about MSME post-COVID. So some are referring to MSME as most severely mauled enterprises, the ones that have got most affected in that sense. Some very interesting experiments happening in the Asia Pacific region in terms of credit guarantee and uh, risk insurance. Anything specific you would like to mention about uh, anything from UNDP India's point of view? Well, yes, I think, um, you know, UNDP and India has been supporting um, very extensively to um, respond to the COVID um, crisis and that covered um, 56 districts in uh, nine states, um, particularly focusing on livelihood opportunities and financing markets um, directly to 200, more than 200,000 households, but also to the, the supply side, which is the um, MSMEs and industry associations. So let me just start by um, focusing on this, um, uh, our support to MSMEs. Um, and, uh, you know, we understand that there are skilling requirements and, and connecting them to educational skills institution where would help bridge um, the demand and supply gap. And I think that was what um, also Mr. Uh, Tiwari was mentioning. And our support is very much focused also at the local level where there are opportunities to really contextualize um, and bridge the, 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 the demand and supply side. Um, and in particular, um, we have been uh, providing very focused support through our projects in um, rural Gujarat and Karnataka. And these are showing um, very promising early results. But um, UNDP also supports directly um, our, our beneficiaries. And I think that has been an important um, aspect of making impact on um, you know, young people directly impacted by COVID because we, as much as we support the MSMEs, we would need um, the young people to be skilled and to be supported to, um, uh, to be, um, you know, um, um, right, uh, you know, um, skilled to to be uh, to be employable. So, um, just a few points maybe here is that um, you know UNDP has been supporting online career development guidance for young people across India, uh, including in rural areas. And you may know of the um, counseling and job readiness support called Sakhonge Sapni, which is a series of um, of videos, and they're all available on YouTube. Um, and um, as I mentioned that youth, young people are not uniform and we, we, we felt that it's important to support the women and migrant workers who lost their jobs due to the pandemic and uh, providing them with uh, alternative access to employment opportunities. And again, these career guidance help 
and and our support to linkaging linking them with employers have um, enabled uh, more than six thousand young um, people to success to be successfully placed um, in e-commerce, logistics, manufacturing, banking, and financing and telecom. This includes, of course, the SMME, SMMEs um, as well. And um, just, um, I think, um, was very encouraging to hear uh, Mr. Tiwari mention about the um, apprenticeship, because again, um, we um, definitely see the this is a strategy for young adults and young people to transition smoothly from school to a work life which is very different and that this is a um, this promotes the link between industry and uh, training institutions and we know from recent ILO reports that there are also returns um, in investment for the SMEs when you actually invest in apprenticeship and you can see the the returns already after one year of apprenticeship but also um, already during the um, apprenticeship period so um, I think these are some of the um, support that we provide uh, in India and uh, directly to the, the supply side MSMEs, but also um, looking at the, um, at, the, at, the, at the young people themselves as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mizuho, uh, for you know, pointing out the various challenges as also the importance to focus on youth and women as specific categories who have to be very much part of the ecosystem in case we are looking at aspirational jobs for rural youth. Um, there is a question that's possibly been posed to Mr. Tiwari, and I'll read this out. If Mr. Tiwari is in a position to answer, please, I would request him to, but otherwise maybe Shabnam might want to include this in her own observations. The question is, uh, sir, what will be an area of focus post COVID in terms of skill development? Omicron, people are already in panic mode. How will it impact the people? Are there any pleasure? plans or measures for next year. Uh, Mr. Tiwari, if you're there, could you respond to this? That's okay. I think uh, I'd now like to invite uh, Ms. Shabnam Sinha from the World Bank. Uh, so one of the primary reasons for unemployment in India is that available jobs do not seem to match the aspirations of the youth. So there's a huge gap between the skills required by the industry and those imparted by higher education and training institutes, uh, including possibly our own institution here at Anand. We know that the World Bank has been supporting MSD, the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship with the Sankal program since 2018. Um, so in your opinion, what do you think is the best strategy to promote aspirational local jobs for rural youth based on Sankalp's own experience in the last few years. Over to you, Shabnam. Thank you very much. And uh, before I begin, I would like to congratulate the UNDP on undertaking this uh, uh, this uh, summit at this critical juncture of uh, uh, of the whole skilling transition in India. So, uh, you know, first of all, I wanted to say that um, you know, like Charles Dickens had said. These are the worst of times, but these are also the best of times. So worst of times, because as you said, COVID is like ravaging the country across the globe, but also because of the opportunities that have uh, been thrown up because of COVID, the opportunities for innovation, the opportunities for regroup and to rethink and to redraw one's strategies is, uh, is really been a, quite rewarding uh, in its own sense where we've been able to use our own uh, uh, you know, sense of creativity to be uh, experimenting with the projects that we've already been supporting. Now we have uh, been engaged, as you mentioned with Sankalp, which is the Skill India mission operation for since 2018, it's a 250 million uh, uh, support to the government of India. And uh, uh, you know, it, it it, it is inherently an extremely uh, flexible uh, kind of a structuring so that, you know, all kinds of innovations can build into it. And it is focused on short-term training programs. So as you uh, asked, you know, what are, what are the, what can we do for the current situation? The current situation, we can't wait for two years programs or we can't wait for four years to, you know, manage to find out solutions. 
It has to be nimble. It has to be just in time. Therefore, the short-term skilling programs have been made in such a way that they can respond to the changing nature of, uh, of, the, of work. Now, the changing nature of work, that is a World Development Report of 2019 of the World Bank, which actually talked, interestingly, just before the onset of COVID, about the changing nature of work, the rise of the gig economy, the rise of technology, and the need for technology. So to answer to your question before I start my own discussion, you know, what do we do in the context of COVID? So in the context of COVID, there are, there are certain priorities, sectors which have been kicked up. One is, of course, this whole area of scaling around healthcare. So if you look at, uh, you know, the, short, the shortages, there are huge amount of shortages of phlebotomists. Phlebotomists are people who take your blood test and, you know, check out the, uh, you know, the COVID uh, tests, etc. There are a huge amount of uh, home care support, GDA assistance and all of that. So we are trying to we support the sector skill councils to take this forward. We showed you the film on logistics. Now, nobody goes to shops anymore. You go to an Amazon, you go to a, 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 a big basket. So the whole logistics industry has been galvanized through our support. But again, coming to the Sankalp project, you know, when we started the project, the Skill India mission had just been launched by the prime minister. And frankly, there was no order in the system. There were 23 ministries doing skilling. The Ministry of Skills had just been put in place. There was no kind of structure which could be brought together, which could, which could uh, you know, pull together all these different elements. So what we did was we created what we call these different institutional structures, which even um, Atul was talking about. So there is a national skill development mission. Within that, there are state skill development missions which aggregate the district skill development missions. So what you heard about the district skill committee, it is the, the Sankal project, which brought about the existence of the district skills committee. And I feel moving forward more and more as we move into the, uh, the uncharted areas as we are moving in COVID, it's the district level reform that is going to be most critical. Decentralization is going to be most critical. So we, we created what's called the District Skills Committee along with the government. And that is represented by the private sector, by the local industry, by the youth themselves, and by, uh, by industry owners, you know, local industry. So then they make a projection of five years as to what are the kind of industry requirements in the local setup. And also what is the kind of migrant, you know, outward migration and inward migration trends that are happening. So then you pre they prepare what I call an annual costing plan, annual work plan and budget, which is consolidated at the state level and funded by the national government. In order to structure this in a manner that it's well balanced, we had what is called a state incentive grant matrix. That is, first of all, have you looked at institutional uh, strengthening? Is your SSDM in place? Are your databases in place? Does your MIS system exist? Secondly, what is the kind of uh, market relevance that you have brought in your projects? So therefore, are your pro uh, programs and skilling programs aligned to the national skills qualifications framework? That was the other, and we, we pegged a lot of money on that because you know people were doing all kinds of trainings which were not certified nor were aligned to the qualifications framework. And lastly, the vulnerable groups, that is the scheduled caste, the scheduled tribes and girls, these were a very important segment that we had to address. So we made that section very flexible. We said you can use direct benefit transfers, you can use vouchers, you can use, use comprehensive programs for support to women, like you know early childhood care, you know crash support to working women, etc. So this this was component one. Second one, the the whole you know connect with the employer. Now you can't individually as an institution, as a as World Bank or as a government of India, you can't go to each and every uh, industry. So, you know, there have been systems which have been created. We supported the National Skill Development Corporation, the NSDC, which you might have heard about. And the NSDC and through the NSDC, they have incubated about 40, 38 now sector skill councils, which look at every sector and which are headed by uh, the industry head of that particular sector. So, for example, if you have a medical uh, healthcare sector skill council, it's headed by Dr. Naresh Trehan. So, the industry leader in that particular sector. 
So we triggered that reform through bringing the NSDC in direct alignment with the uh, with the with the state governments, with the district level committees, and that is how we try to link the entire uh, you know private sector reform and the private sector initiatives. But as you mentioned, the MSME sector, especially in the context of the returning migrants, which have been massive, and you, your paper also mentions that six states have had most returning migrants. So this was an issue we started addressing, trying to look at what are responses that could be provided. So it was, uh, and this the Minister uh, of Skills started himself in his own uh, constituency in Uttar Pradesh, that you know, we started triggering, we went down further from the uh, district level, we went to the Gram Panchayats. And at the Gram Panchayat level, uh, an analysis was done of who are the returning migrants. These returning migrants were, some of them were skilled, some were semi-skilled, some were not skilled at all. So skilling programs were taken for the unskilled ones and recognition of prior learning was taken for those who were, you know, who had prior skills, but who needed to be certified in order to move them into the labor market. And then they were actually, these people were skilled and they were employed in the local industry. So there could be an NREGS or an M Manrega or there were utilities, you know, which the government itself was providing. So they were connected into that. So this local area planning has been very critical and moving forward, uh, you know, I would not like to take a lot of time. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer that. We are now moving towards what's called uh, the grid uh, methodology that is green, resilient, inclusive development. So for grid, we are now going to be supporting especially the green jobs. And, uh, you know, there's another project that we have with the Ministry of Education, which is a $500 million project which is looking very critically at several other components, but school to work transition is going to be very important there. So we are also trying to see how can schools become solar, have solar panels, have, can become green schools, can have that kind of uh, you know, structures and mechanisms where we can connect them to the labor market, you know, into the solar industry, to the green industry. And we are trying to, we have tied up with the, with the sector skill council of, uh, green jobs to try and bring about this. So the grid uh, methodology moving forward for all development agencies is going to be very critical. And we are very happy that the government of India using Sankalp funds has also been um, supporting the UNDP on some of the work on female labor force participation. Uh, but what I just wanted to end with is that, yes, these are very difficult times, but now is the time for us to innovate, to innovate, to include, and to move forward. Uh, with that, I'll just stop here. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take it. Thanks a lot, Shabnam. Uh, I might just want you to elaborate a bit more on the same point that Ms. Zuha has also referred to in terms of uh, green transitions and green jobs. Uh, in a sense, is this likely to increase uh, during after the pandemic? And is there a shift towards it in some sense in terms of looking at local economies and probably uh, you know reducing the uh, costs of it so how how does one look at this transition towards more green jobs uh, any insights on that uh, both of you could speak on it a bit before we get to sujit so there are uh, two critical elements that need to be addressed you know at the current times one is pandemic response, the other is climate change. So if you are not prepared, if their resilience systems are not prepared to respond to these two global realities, uh, we will be left behind in the race and we are going to be in deep trouble. So these green resilient, uh, you know, just to give you one little sense of uh, what we are doing in the state of Gujarat, that's a $1 billion support to the state of Gujarat on school education reform. Now each school is being made a green school. There is a solar panel. And if you look at the economics of the solar paneling, it's so interesting that the solar panels will be put up. You know, whatever uh, green energy is required for the school is being taken from that. And then the extra energy is actually routed to other agencies or other uh, institutions or to other individuals who want to buy that energy. And the money that comes back from it is actually routed back into the schooling system. So it's a very interesting economic cycle which is emerging. 
uh, especially in the state of Gujarat, and which is pretty progressive right now in these thinking. And we are trying to scale it up nationally now with our uh, energy, uh, uh, you know, global practice of the World Bank. Um, I'll just uh, stop here if uh, you would like to say something. Mizuho, uh... uh, <clears throat> I'd like you to come back to this point a bit later, but uh, uh, maybe at this point, we'll also have some initial comments from Sujit. Uh, Mizuho, you had referred to digitalization and digital solutions. In some sense, there's been a reference to the inclusion of the private sector in the ecosystem. Uh, so, Sujit, Udan has been in the news for creating innovative B2B technology solutions, making trader, trading easier for farmers, SMEs, etc. Um, so, such supply chain solutions have the potential to creation of thousands of jobs in India. So the question for you is what can be done by policymakers and development partners and practitioners to ensure that the millions of youth who have basic educational qualifications and face the digital divide, especially those in rural areas are absorbed in the opportunities arising from the expansion of such tech-based solutions. And I think Udan is a good example. I think you also believe in the fact that uh, the e-commerce is not just uh, the fad of the urban part of India, but there is a significant scope in the rural areas as well. Over to you, Sujit. Hi, th and thank, thanks, uh, Professor Sambhu, and thanks, everyone. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a very unique uh, uh, event where I've been invited. Most of it is like a startup or uh, how, how technology is changing. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll give my perspective. Uh, so uh, given given my background, uh, I've started my journey uh, with the various startup, but uh, I think two of them were um, significant one. First, I've started with the Flipkart. So I, I've seen the B2C journey since 2008 and uh, being part till 2016. And then I've started uh, B2B commerce. Um, I also call it uh, it's a it's a Bharat ka e-commerce because if you see 95% uh, of the consumptions are happening through these 25 million retail uh, points, retail shops all across India, be it rural, tier one, tier two, tier three cities. Um, I think these are the opportunity. We see that uh, how to how to solve the uh, commerce using technology, and if you see in India last seven eight years, the way uh, people are using technology, especially internet and through which they consume content, they, they do the messaging, using to enhance their business, for payment, for almost everything, right? So beat it, if you'll see uh, all the innovations, uh, like some, some of the people were talking how to, how to make people skill and all. I, I see it as a, uh, just uh, education techs are already solving this problem, am I right? We have to also change our, ourselves. Uh, 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 so I'm not going there, but when, when we are building this, uh, when uh, Uran has seen that how to make these 25 million retail shops and 150 million farmers, which are producing all kinds of stuff in this country, uh, how to procure and enhance their income and rest of the things they will take care of it. So remo removing the inefficiency, layers of inefficiencies, I think that was our focus. So in distributions, when manufacturer manufacturing the goods, how it's going to the retailer and through retailer, consumer are consuming. So how to make that relentless and for retailers, how they should use their working capital to grow the business. Can they sell more to the same consumer uh, in their catchment area? I think all those, because sourcing is a problem. They, they struggle to source for one category if they have the shop and they have the customer captive customer, can they so sell uh, more than one category and give the better uh, customer service? So I think that what we uh, are in the journey of solving, and that's a huge, huge business. But more than business, how it is impacting 150 million farmers? Definitely, like you have asked, hey, what is the message for the policymakers? Am I right? If you see, there are several policies through which. Uh, 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 farmers cannot directly sell to uh, where they uh, get get their maximum benefit. Am I right? So all this raw law has to be all, also relooked in the empowerment when the technology is a uh, 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 real uh, infrastructure of empowering millions of people. So how to use that and the policy which are preventing 
uh, the benefits of technology for these farmers and those small retailers, that those has to be relooked. And government is already doing lots of it. Let's say digitization of lots, recognition of uh, of of uh, retailers so that they can get the um, they do, they can get the credit because earlier they were not recognized as a priority sector lending. Now the government has changed. Even even their qualification has been changed. If you'll see uh, uh, lots of things in last several years, last especially for five six years has changed. Especially the number of accounts number of accounts has been opened uh, in this country. Uh, if you see the UPI way, the payments are happening. I think all these things are very, very positive uh, developments where people are directly connected rather than going through a uh, various inefficient layer. So what I'm also um, like, if, if you see the impact of policy um, in 2017, July, GST has come and which changed the whole uh, whole uh, uh, face of the country. How, how to say that? Because then the inefficient supply chain prior to prior to GST has been removed with one one law. So one country, one tax has prevailed. Earlier, the every state has a different kind of law. Some goods you cannot carry. Some goods you can carry. So what I think government what. They are doing facilitation job rather than entrenching to solve and uh, solving the supply chain. So change those hurdles and you will see the impacts. So now if you'll see after 2017, earlier, prior to 2017, every state has some entry barrier. No large infrastructure development, warehousing were happening. And because of those warehousing uh, were not happening or cold storage, Lots of wastage of food materials and any kind of uh, 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 cost of supply chain are very high. So I'm just giving example change the same way the internet has been changed the overall face of this country uh, because people are now taking the direct benefit, be it any of the government policies as well as any of the uh, any of uh, the transfer. They don't have to travel. So. I think be the part of that change. Uh, that's my uh, uh, and again the several policies like GST, like uh, uh, digitization of uh, of whole country, and it it is it has to come. Uh, especially in the farming sector, also I'm in agriculture. It has to be relooked. Um, so that's that's my uh, some of the suggestions. But we are in that journey. Uh, like uh, Professor Shambhu have asked, uh, we see that we we are. Serving three million, uh, three million retailers, and all seventy percent of the retailers are beyond tier two, tier three, uh, tier one, tier two cities. We are reaching to more than nine hundred cities uh, uh, to uh, supply these goods to the retailers, and their their earnings are changing because they don't have to travel from let's say Nagaland to Surat to procure uh, some uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, sari. Or manufacturing uh, any any of the, these things, they are just ordering and they are getting within two or three days. So I think uh, that that lots of movements are happening on the surface. We have to also relook. Like I'm I'm just requesting because I have seen the representative from the World Bank and UNDP. They have to also change lots of the, the grants they are giving. How to make it more impactful uh, uh, and using the technology rather than just. Uh, 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 using 20 or 30 years back mechanism i think that's just a request i'm not saying that you guys are not doing it but i think it can be more effective if the data-based decisions are happening thanks a lot sujit for i uh, will come back to you in a minute uh, i gather shabnam will have to leave shabnam i think sujit has posed a question to you but before that there's also a question that was there on uh you know how can msd respond to the 21st century upskilling and reskilling. Any brief comments on that before uh, you did mention you have to move to another meeting now. Yeah, over to you, Shah. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, you know, the, the context of COVID has changed the entire complexion of the way we are moving on skilling. And also it has, uh, you know, the whole MSME storyline is going to be very critical on how skilling is going to be transforming itself. Um, you know, we, 
um, I will come to your question, Sujit, but uh, the way we look at this whole sector is while we provide the funds to the government of India, we also provide some te technical support, which are in the form of grants to ensure that knowledge keeps flowing within the, uh, within the programs of the government of India. So now nobody is interested in the typical construction and plumbing and all of that, which happens, the big ones happen in the ITIs. There is more interest in the aspirational uh, segments, the aspirational sectors, which give you a job immediately. So one is, of course, you saw the logistics sector skill council work. One is green jobs. I already spoke about that. The other is the banking financial insurance sector uh, jobs. The BFSI sector, we've supported, again, um, Sujit, for your information, we are moving with our grant mechanism towards these futuristic and priority areas. So we are not, while we provide support to the government, but you know, um, that's our institutional support. We provide support to smaller startups like you. For example, we've supported a startup, which has actually come up with a skills registry, which is an online skills registry in partnership with, uh, um, you know, those urban, urban clap, urban company. You know, so these are the newer age um, support that we are providing. And they have actually made a map of who are the people who are returning back? What are the kinds of skills that they go back with? And what are the kinds of uh, skilling that they need? And it's all online, it's all tech-based. And we, you don't have to touch anything. Everything is on with you in an Excel sheet. And uh, so, you know, one is trying to uh, respond to the situation and the situation is so rapidly evolving that each one of us has to be extremely innovative, extremely nimble in the response. But I agree with Suji that uh, people like you are going to be very, very crucial, very critical in the change in the way India is changing moving forward. And uh, tech companies, you know, connecting tech companies with funders is also very important because, you know, there are a whole lot of startups who are running around with no funds. So, you know, we, we are happy to connect you with, uh, you know, what should I say, these investment bankers with social impact uh, investors, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we are always open. And we do have a pot of funds, not too much, but very little, which are grant oriented. And we are looking at innovative ideas. If you have something which is innovative, you're welcome to come to us. We are also moving as fast as the young generation. So. No, right. no, thanks, ma'am. My question was not. I'm just saying that. No, no, I understand. No. But uh, just yeah. to give you that sense that, you know, it's not just one is the loan to the government, the other is the more nimble technical assistance grants, which we get. But uh, happy to speak to you anytime. Thank you so much, Shabnam, for your time. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. My yeah. apologies. I'll need to leave a little early. We have a meeting with the ministry. Uh, so it was a pleasure meeting all of you. And happy to connect. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sujit, coming back to you, um, you know, you work, you you know, much closely with youngsters with different kind of aspirations, uh, and you have ambitious plans to reach out to the tier two, tier three cities, and maybe even further down to the rural areas. So, what are the skills that you are experiencing that are preventing? today's youth from being employable in the industry, uh, industry broadly classified, not just manufacturing or any such thing. So, uh, you know, the youth are there and there is a requirement also of certain kinds of skills, but sometimes there seems to be a mismatch. So what, how do you see this in, in your own work? And you're, you, you've seen the sector for long enough, so you might want to share with us your insights. No, I think that's a great question, uh, Professor Sambhu. Um, I, I, in the last 15 years, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the kind of nature of job has gone through significant changes. Um, so when I was passing out from the college, most of the jobs either outside, because I passed out from IIT Delhi, so most of the job you have like outside of the country, or it was concentrated in two or three cities. If you If you'll see, that's not... That's not the case now. Also, I will give you one data. In a startup, I don't know other government or any, or any of the uh, uh, um, initiative by any of the bodies, but let's say startup India, in last 10 to 12 years, and because that's where it has, it, it has started the journey, 
practically has employed a uh, directly no i am not calling it indirectly directly more than uh, 5 to 6 million people in that the delivery boys in that uh, how how uh, 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 in warehousing manufacturing uh, 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 working on content so the nature of job part time full time so like we are in e-commerce so our, for us the people who are, can work in a warehouse do the last mile delivery truckers uh, 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 definitely technology point of uh, technology point category sourcer merchandiser all these are very plain jobs which people understand but if you see like education tech health tech content creator uh, 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 i think th- th- those jobs were not existing 10 years back and also the internet which is the largest enabler uh, and technology which is the largest enabler in this country which in more than 800 million people are using and attached and they are consuming the content which are very relevant to them so bringing the technology how which people suits which job is the most important one and people now understand the jobs are not only concentrated in these three four five top 10 cities they they can find out a job which is relevant to them let's say uh, in banaras there are jobs of e-commerce available where and the skills are as good as but it's in bangalore and you you are also connected and you are part of that overall evolution so i think uh, uh, using the technology and bringing the relevancy up skilling if you see there are lots of education tech which are making them learn let's say ai kind of job which are like a high end job uh, but content creations and and these are these are anywhere it can happen if you see the uh, uh, platforms like where video short videos created most of the, they they get created in villages and their views now 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 they are earning through the influencer on the social media so you don't have to come to mumbai for that or in delhi or in bangalore so i think the nature of jobs are very uh, ch- changing and we have to address that uh, uh, in a very formal way because employment is not something and definitely covid has also posed like posed all those traditional uh, 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 way of doing job everything is a possible for uh, working from home so if a person who is only available for 5 or 6 years working woman i think they they have the job so they can do the job from home so we have to also bring lots of recognition and the nature of job in the as a how to address employment like government publish the data i i don't know what kind of data goes in that employment yeah so uh, <clears throat> thanks sujit i think this relates also to the question that just been posed now suppose i am from a rural area i am studying in a government school my academics is not so strong uh, i am you know i am a young person and i have an aspiration uh, what kind of programs would you advise i should be joining and are there any such programs that are well designed for them uh, how do how should they be looking at their aspirations in the job market yeah that's another point also i was saying that now people don't care about which which degree you possess if you have a skill and you have a job that's how i see that and there are platform which enhances your skills uh, so releveling of the, your skill uh, on on the platform on the internet you don't have to go anywhere point and then those jobs also are available and most importantly if you see that now the startup is going into more local solving the local problem uh, 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 so point is how to create a funds which supports these small entrepreneurs in a very tier 3 cities which are solving the local problem so all the funds let's say when it started in 2000 let's say 5 or 6 most of the funds were concentrated in mumbai bangalore and delhi now if you see now it's, it's not the phenomena but now government has also start up funds which are deploying there are lots of state government at the fund they are giving but bringing a commercial value for the local uh, uh, impact and job and inefficiency will bring lots of job within the same uh, locality and if you'll see the agri tech lots of investments are going into the agri tech where the agricultures are happening in village 
and there are startups which has become unicorn and unicorn are impacting uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers through the data and they are they are influencing them what to produce and all so all the people like your question if you have a degree no degree doesn't matter i don't think so uh, uh, currently in a startup uh, people are looking for that which degree you have i don't think so definitely you have you the several way i can assess your education so thanks sujit for making the distinction between education and degree so uh, you know the famous quote i never let my uh, degree come in the way of education and that's a lof- lifelong process uh, but just a point which before i get back to mizuho and perhaps both of you together so i think while we are talking about reaching you know the unreached areas either in tier 2 tier 3 or rural areas uh, one part of course is the issue of access the other is to do with the issue of content and a diverse country like india requires content delivered in multiple languages so how do you see this whole process of vernacularization of the programs and uh, what role does udan also play in trying to be as vernacular as possible in the regions that you work like i said that we are a commerce platform so definitely we have a multiple language uh, where where uh, where retailers can buy but i think but i think i'll give a, a, anecdotes in other let's say content consumption if you see there are platforms which are creating those uh, 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 local vernacular languages contents and they have huge adoption from the village tier 3 tier 4 cities so the content itself uh, 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 so that's the largest consumption and there are various platform i don't have to name any but there are various platform all of them are getting their daily users are in millions and they are not in tier 1 city they are in somewhere in village tier 3 tier 4 cities so content creation consumption because if you see the data of consumption and on the internet indian in india is one of the largest data consumer per capita i'm not saying that overall per capita largest consumer who is who is consuming so uh, i think uh, uh, there are lots of innovation like answer to your question we are commerce we are only supporting in a various let's say uh, discovery search language interaction customer support i think that the vernacular part of uh, earlier only english uh, as a prominent language now there are regional languages like tamil hindi kannada uh, malayalam uh, gujarati i think those bengali i i think you get all those, those are given so you don't have to uh, work hard but the most in, uh, most dynamic uh, uh, content creation and the consumption are happening in a vernacular language which are like phenomenal nobody can and a lot of companies are building on top of so thanks thanks a lot sujit for your insights on uh, the opportunities that are in in uh, available for people in rural areas if they were to look at things somewhat differently it requires a different mindset shift to move away from just learning english or doing well academically but to be focused more on sometimes your own passion and uh, what you aspire and the avenues today to as you know to connect with what you are interested in is probably much more than what was there maybe 5 10 years back etc or surely at least 20 30 years back i remember an occasion where i met a farmer in mirzapur a few months back before the second wave and uh, he was doing some amazing experiments in agriculture in his very small farm and i asked him and nobody else he didn't get this information from any agricultural extension officer so i asked him where did you pick this up and he said i saw some youtube videos i was interested in it he had come back from the united arab emirates after working as a driver or mechanic but his passion was in farming and he found so and he connected with him and you know this happened without either the state or any ngo being part of the story so there are these peer to peer kind of exchanges that uh have been providing a lot of ideas for some of course in this case this was a fairly mature individual having seen a lot of uh life already and wanting to do something different in his own village 
but I'm sure yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Professor Sambu on that part. I have grown up in villages, so yes. I come from farmer's family. Uh, uh, so I have done my 12th in, in like tier 3, tier 4 cities from village. So I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Mizuho, I think we just want to come back to this point I was asking earlier about... And Greece. Professor Sambu, I, as I said, I have to go. So I, I think... Okay. Uh, so thanks for hosting uh, me and thank you. Sure, sure. Thank, thanks a lot, Sujit, for joining us and sharing your insights. Thanks. Uh, Mizuho, can I request you to tell us a little bit more on, you know, the potential for green jobs uh, uh, and the challenge in green transition? Yes, of course. And thank you for that um, question. And I think I reflect on also um, the points that are made by the earlier speakers. And one thing I just wanted to get back to was um, India's um, commitment that was made during the pre-COP26 um, high-level dialogue on energy. And it was really fascinating that um, one of the few countries in the Asia Pacific region that um, committed to really concrete targets was India. And that was to reduce the mission intensity of GDP um, by 20, 30, 33 to 35 percent um, by 2030. And, and this is by through increasing renewable energy and in all sectors, agriculture, banking industry, and transportation sectors. So I think that. Um, um, that really already signifies the national commitment to how um, the economic diversification and energy transitions will, will shape up um, in the coming years. And I think as um, Mr. Sujit was also mentioning, this is the way the nature of jobs will change also in the future. And I think what is um, important here is um, taking it to scale. And, um, and that requires, of course, strong uh, leadership by the government with a strong and long-term vision. It cannot be done today and tomorrow I change. And you know, it, it does require sort of long-term um, vision. And um, I think the role of government to facilitate this process and uh, together with the different partners in, in the society. And that re um, turns back to what um, uh, Mr. Atul was saying about the whole society approach. And I think that's where, um, you know, UNDP as a partner that was, um, you know, um, 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 partnering towards the high level dialogue is that we work also um, through the government and really taking these um, transitions to to scale, and um, really showing the the, the models. And because we we are not we won't be replacing the government, but we can show um, the examples and and pilot the models um, as we as I have mentioned earlier. And for that uh, for that to be handed over to the governments, I think taking to scale and and in the context of um, of uh, of India's transition and how that will have implications on the um, employment and labor market, especially for the young people in the rural areas in India. The second point um, that I just also wanted to, um, to mention was about um, digitalization and technological change that has a lot to do with also the green transitions. And um, a large part, of course, could be about infrastructure and um, again, linked to the commitments that were made by the government. But um, I think what UNDP's approach um, in India and also in other countries in the region has been about, you know, what is there that um, provides an enabling environment through you know, training, entrepreneurship, counseling, job counseling, and and provide ensuring the transition from education to the labor market, um, and also connecting them, you know, young people to the market and finance, and you know, strengthening value chains. So, I think um, when we talk about sort of green transitions and 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 digital, um, and also in, involving digital, it's not just about infrastructure, but there are a lot of sort of supportive measures that um, are required. Um, and um, I think that uh, we should not forget that there are um, also other measures and a systematic and policy um, oriented approach that is needed to addressing and leaving no one behind um, agenda in this um, transition, particularly for young people and women. And I there refer to the importance of social protection because um, 
of course, you know, um, many young people and women, young women aspire to be in the labor market, but because of their unpaid, you know, care work, their skills and um, accessibility to either education or, or um, you know, employment opportunities, they there needs to be um, a further support. And that here, I, I don't talk about cash transfers because that will not resolve the issue of employability and, and unpaid care work, but the importance of linking social protection to labor market interventions. And that, that requires and should be fostered with partnership with the private sector. So um, again, it's a, it's a holistic approach to, sorry, I'm going a little bit sort of in different directions to, to go back to your question, but um, this is um, how UNDP sees um, that is, you know, green transition, you know, digital transition is not just about, you know, um, um, technologies and, and, and infrastructure, but it is about the policy, the long term vision, combined with um, approaches to not leave um, uh, the vulnerable people, especially the young, uh, the youth and the women behind. Thank you, Mizuho. I think just a follow up question to it, and possibly, unless there are more questions, we could probably end with that. Uh, you know, this whole dimension of building better together and trying to move towards inclusive entrepreneurship, where the women labor force participation increases, youth are more involved, uh, is something that requires a lot of collaboration. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, as you also mentioned, in some sense, it's, it's to do more than, you know, uh, creating the infrastructure and uh, the platforms, et cetera. But also an important part seems to be how do you get actors to work together, to think together about a common problem and find solutions together. So any insights on, uh, on this particular part on collaboration, thinking together, uh, as we can imagine. Yes, thank you. I think that's really the the, um, the future of our approach to um, the entrepreneurship and inclusive entrepreneurship. So, um, as I mentioned in my example in Malaysia, I think it's uh, really bringing all the stakeholders around um, the same sort of dialogue and policy table and really coming to an understanding of, of the issues. And um, with so many um, actors in, in, in the room, um, we could be going on in all different directions, but I think um, it's coming to the same common understanding of the issues where that could maybe exist in small scales in SMME sectors and also informal sectors, but they're cut across um, the same issues. And I think there also you identify the role of the state, but also a role of the um, other actors and, and the business can play a very important role and academic institutions, as well as also the groups of women and young people and not to forget the importance of the local governments and, and the district level. So, so I think um, that kind of dialogue and uh, setting the agendas and vision and uh, coming to the same understanding of the issues are, are really crucial. And I think that was how Malaysia um, was able to kind of agree and the government to come to a, a proposal of how to reduce the risks among and provide support to the SMS SMEs and informal sectors. So, so I think that um, approach would be very, very crucial. Um, and I think um, I was very interested to hear from uh, Mr. Atul about uh, the approaches of India and how to localize and contextualize issues at the district level. And I think that's very important in a huge country like India. You can't have everything driven by the state, but you need uh, local and bottom-up solutions who know the people, who know the young people, who know the women and what skills, um, they did skills, skills assessment to identify the opportunities. And that that's where I think the challenge, the, the focus will be more from a challenge to opportunities and how you can really um, make a change in the community because it's really about social mobility and only, only the local, um, community will be the ones that really want to see those change happening um, um, at, at, at the community. So, and that that becomes a, a national effort, uh, I believe. So, um, and let me stop here. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mizuho, for your insights. And, uh, you know, in the absence of any further questions, and uh, I'd like to 
make a quick summary of some of the discussions we've had. I think we've had a very interesting uh, discussions on the key topic on aspirational jobs for the rural youth. Um, we started with Mr. Tiwari presenting to us the ideas that are coming up in and the challenges during COVID. Um, you know, how Sankalp as a program has been conceived where uh, the ideas have been rooted much more on how do we build capacities at the district and the rural levels, the district sector councils being one example, and also the possibility in the design to see how they could be customized to local requirements, following some broad standards of the sector skill councils and the, uh, you know, the quality parameters that have been mentioned. Mizuho spoke about the challenges on the limited safety nets that exist for women, uh, the need to build better together, uh, the various examples from Malaysia and other countries on trying to increase the resilience of MSMEs, the need for risk insurance, uh, the youth collaboratories in some sense in many, many of the other countries. UNDP India has been trying in terms of education. Shabnam spoke to us about the uh, flexible structuring in terms of opportunities in, uh, you know, in skilling, uh, the incentives grants that exist, uh, the support of NSDEC. There was a reference by both Shabnam and Mizuho on green jobs. And uh, Sujit pointed us to, to us the major changes that have happened in recent years where technology can be an enabler. Uh, the big ticket changes have happened from the government in terms of, uh, you know, UPI, which is making things possible. GST, the data penetration being very high, people learning a lot in local languages. And the fact that this is no more an urban phenomenon, but uh, quite deep rooted. And finally, we would like to leave us with this thought that uh, while the there is indeed a lot of opportunity, we saw some films on newer kinds of jobs that rural youth and particularly women have been looking at. Uh, there's still a lot of scope for collaboration in uh, in the sector where the government needs to work actively with local governments, the private sector with civil society organizations and social enterprises to create more local jobs uh, as we move into a post-pandemic world. Thank you very much, Mizuho, and all our participants, uh, uh, our panelists, uh, Sujit, Shabnam, and Mr. Tiwari for their very useful and insightful contributions. Over to you, uh, Priyank, and others at Access. Uh, thank you very much, panelists, for such a thought-provoking discussion. And special thanks to Shambhu, sir, for a very deft moderation. With this, we'll, uh, we'll end this session and we'll take a short break to reconvene at 3.25 for a session on development pathways for social protection of vulnerable population of India. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.